Well, good morning. It is so wonderful to be with you this morning. Thank you so much for the opportunity to come and hang out. Can we just give another shout out to that worship team? Oh, man. Man, I kind of want to just do that again, don't you? Amen. Amen. That was awesome. Thank you guys so much. I know you put a hard work, a lot of work in that, and it was awesome. Be sure and tell them. Be sure when you see them, you be like, thank you guys so much for just rocking out here. It's, love seeing young people up on stage. I mean, that's the future of our church right there, right? Amen, amen. Well, hey, I am James Wynn. Um, I work with Global Partners, and that is the missions department for the Wesleyan Church. Uh, so I live in Indiana at the headquarters out there, and um, just an honor to be here with you as we look to kick off a month of talking about missions and talking about the Great Commission and all that God is doing in that way and how we can be a part of that. Amen? amen. All right. Ooh, I love the amens. Uh, a couple things about me. So um, I'm married. I have a wife. I have three daughters. Uh, thank you, Lord, for the help and allowing me to live that out. Three more years, and the last one's out the house. Freedom. I love it. I'm just kidding. I love my girls. If you're watching online anywhere, I love you. You, you know I love you. But, man, go move out. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, we're so blessed. We, we lived overseas in Central Asia for about 18 years. We lived in a predominantly Muslim country. Um, so very, very few Christians, um, not any witness at all. And our hope and our, our, our purpose for being there was to share the love of Jesus. So we did house churches and planting. We also did humanitarian work as kind of our avenue for being in the country. And God really um, used that time both to develop and grow us, but to also take the gospel to a place. When we moved there in the year 2000, there were less than 3,000 known believers in that country of over 9 million people. Um, and today there's probably 15 to 20,000 believers and a lot of house churches and God is doing fantastic things there and we love to see that. Six years ago we were asked by our department to move back and, and to work in our home office and so now I do mobilization, recruiting and trying to go out and find more people, re re reproduce myself to say, hey, would you be willing to go? And my wife is on the training and equipping team. Our hearts are still very much wanting to be amongst the unreached overseas but for this season the Lord has us here. Uh, it was quite a journey actually. We when we were asked to come back, I was like, no, thank you very much. I pretty much want to stay over there. I don't want to move to Indiana. I don't know if any of you have ever been to Indiana. Sorry for all you Indiana people, but you know, you know, it's, it's just not a great place to live. There's cornfields. It's just, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Anyway, hope no one's from Indiana. Um, but the Lord was working in our hearts, and we took a vote, and the family was five to nothing. We wanted to stay on the field. And my oldest daughter, who was 16 at the time and had the most to lose, you know, she was coming back her junior year or whatever, and she said, but dad, if God wants us to do this, we should probably obey. And I was like, listen, kid, this is a family conversation. You keep Jesus out of this. We're not trying to hear that. We're trying to do what we want to do. Um, but God made it very clear, and so we, we made the move back, and now we get an opportunity to connect with young people, connect college students and, and churches, and just cast vision for what God is doing around the world. So... Um, I'm also a little bit of a weird dude. I talk very fast, if you can hear that. I got a whole lot of ADHD going on, um, but I also love Jesus, and so I get excited. And so when I talk about him, it, it just comes out, and, and I've, I've fallen off a few stages. Hopefully, I won't do it here, but if I do, it's all right. We're just, we're just excited for Jesus today, amen? amen? Amen, awesome. Well, I would love this morning to chat with you a little bit about Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 and 20. Matthew 28, 16 and 20. This is the Great Commission. Um, oftentimes when you hear that phrase, the Great Commission, some people have no idea what it is, you've never heard it. Others are like, yeah, isn't that some kind of thing Jesus said at, kind of at the end of his life? You know, he just kind of gave us these words. But what I want to talk about this morning is actually a very intentional, strategic statement made by Jesus. Not something that he just kind of said on his way up, you know, after he died and was just ascending back to heaven. But this was a very purposeful statement. It was meant for his entire family, for all the followers of Jesus, for all the people who say, I am a follower of him. This is, this is an important thing for him. So I want to check this out this morning and then see how this applies to us. So the Great Commission, beginning in verse 16, says, Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Now I want to pause there, because that's a, a little bit of context. It sets the stage for this in, in an amazing way. So this is post-resurrection, Right? Jesus has already died on the cross, he's already risen again, and, and he's um, at this stage of his journey in life. And, and look what it said there, it says, the 11 disciples left for God going to a mountain where Jesus told them to go. See, prior to this, Jesus had never told anybody where he was going to be post-resurrection. Remember, the disciples are all hiding in the room, whatever, and then suddenly, boom, Jesus is right there among them. Remember that? Or they're walking along the path, and suddenly there's someone there walking along, and they're like, who are you? And then they realize it's Jesus, and he's gone. 
That's the way he showed up oftentimes after his resurrection. But at this moment in time, he said, I want to meet you there in that mountain. I want to meet you there in a little bit of time. I don't know about you, but had I been alive back then, had I been around that time and I heard this man who was crucified and killed is now supposed to be alive and he's going to show up here, what are you going to do? I'm going to the mountain, right? I'm going to be there. I'm going to be like, wait, wait, what? I'm going to hear what this is, what it says. It says later then some of them, they worship him, but some of them doubted. Well, he'd already appeared to his 12 disciples. You remember Thomas? He was like, I, I don't know. And he, he put his whole hands in the holes and all that. So we know that it's more than just the 12 disciples who are here. In fact, Paul says later in, um, I believe, 1 Corinthians yeah, 15, he says, he was seen by Peter and then by 12. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time. Now, most of the writers and, and, and commentators believe that this was that moment, that Jesus was appearing before a crowd of more than 500 people. And he has something very important to tell them. He gathered them together. And this is not just something he says at the end of his life, you know, when he ascended into heaven. That actually happened at a different geographical location. That was at the Mount of Olives where Jesus was when he ascended to heaven. So this was a very specific, intentional moment when he said, I've got something I want to tell you. It's very important. Let everybody know. Get there because I've got a mission for you. I've got a charge for you. Moving on in verse 18, as Jesus is there on the mountain in front of a probably well over 500 people, he says, he came and he told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. The Great Commission, go, make disciples of all nations, all nations. That was the command that Jesus gave to his disciples. You, he, he, he said, you have seen me, you've experienced what it's been like, you've walked with me, you've journeyed with me, you've seen the miracles, you've heard the teachings, you've seen me die, you've seen me resurrect. And now I'm empowering you to take this message to the world. Now I confess to you this morning, I don't know why he chooses to use us. I mean, you guys are probably way more spiritual than I am, but I, 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 I do dumb stuff. I say dumb things. I'm like, surely, Lord, there is a better way to get the gospel out there than by using me. But God's like, nope, you are my chosen means. I want you who've experienced my love, who've experienced my, my, the, the mission, who've experienced a, a new relationship with me, I want you to take that message to the world. You are my chosen means of doing that. And this morning as we sit here, this message is for us. When we entered into a relationship with Jesus, when we said, yes, I want to be a part of you, I want to be with, in a relationship with you, we have been adopted into that family. We are now heirs to the kingdom. We can celebrate that. You can say amen. Heirs to the kingdom, amen? And along with that comes the commissioning that he gave to his disciples, his followers. Tell others. Make disciples. Let people know about me. But it doesn't quite end there. The very end of verse 20 says, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And you, and you couple that with what he said at the very beginning. I have been given all authority in heaven on earth. Oh, ooh, this gets exciting right here. Sorry, I get a little goosebumpy now. This is, we just sang about him, the king of kings, amen? This is the creator of all things. He gave life with his very breath over everything. He said, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. There is no authority, no power above him. Amen? Amen. And he who has all authority is with us. What? That's a little exciting, isn't it? He's with us. I'm not doing some crazy task and some crazy mission all on my own. I'm doing God's mission, and I'm doing it with him. When God was like, I, I, I graduated in, um, I went to college in Oklahoma Wesleyan University, which was back then, but um, I wasn't a believer when I went. I was 19 years old. There was no other school around, so I just like, whatever, I'll go to this Christian school. Um, I deliberately took less than full load my, my first year, so I didn't have to go to chapel, because who wants to go to chapel? Um, but while there, through the grace of God, you know, I, I was confronted with the gospel, and I met Jesus, and I became a follower of Jesus. But my degree is elementary education, so I ended up teaching third grade for two years, and then I was like, man, I got to do something easier, so I'm, I moved to the Muslim world. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. I love kids. Love it. But my degree was elementary ed, and the Lord was like, you know, 
that's fantastic, your journey, but now you belong to me. And now you've experienced this love and, this, and, and, and my love in your life and, and this new freedom, this new creation, who you are, the new name, all the stuff we sang about. So wonderful, I celebrate that. But now you gotta be on mission. And for you, that means you gotta move halfway around the world. You gotta move to, to work with Muslim people for, where there is no gospel, no witness. I'm like, Lord, I can't do that. I, I, who am I? God's like, no, 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 no. It's me. I'm doing it. You're just my voice. You're going to represent me. You're my ambassador. And so I get to be a part of his mission. And that's the wonderful thing about the Great Commission is that he wants each and every one of us to be involved in his work, his mission. You know, here's the great thing about this is if it doesn't work, it's on him. It's not us. Freedom. All we got to do is be obedient. The results are in his hands. Amen. I love that. I love it. Great Commission. We got to go. We got to take the gospel to places. In Acts chapter 1, uh, verse 8, Jesus says, and the Holy Spirit will come upon you and give you power. Once again, full authority, full power with the Holy Spirit. We are empowered to go. It's not in our strength. But he said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Oftentimes when we say that, we'll say, Jerusalem, that's kind of your here, right in your area, your community. Judea, that's a little bit further out, your kind of region. Samaria, now you're getting broad nationally in the ends of the earth. We've got to take the gospel to the places where they've never heard. You're here, near, far, and even to those hard places. When I read that verse, though, you need to notice something in there. Jerusalem, it does not say Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, then the ends of the earth. Nope. It doesn't say Jerusalem or Judea or Samaria or the ends of the earth. Nope. We got Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, what? And, uh uh-oh, can one more time? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. See, it's not a either or. It's a both and. As a missionary, as I travel and talk to churches, oftentimes I hear people say, that's wonderful for them, but just so you know, there are people right here that need Jesus. And my response is always the same, absolutely. You're absolutely right, and I hope and I pray that you sitting here as a follower of Jesus are engaged in your community. I hope you are living out your faith in your schools, in your places of work, in your neighborhood. If you're not doing that, we just wanna pause right here and say, would you just consider getting involved? I know Scent Church is doing so many things and, and to reach your community, to engage and connect. How can you get involved? Because the Lord wants you to live this out right here in this place. But it's not an either or. It's not just here or there. It's here and there. So we also have to think about those places where there is no witness, where there is no gospel, where there are no believers. And it's hard to imagine this. Uh, I, I will never forget when we stepped off the plane into that Muslim country where 0, less than 0.01% would be followers of Jesus. So for anyone who does math, you know, statistics, I, I, I taught third grade. We were like two times two is four. That's about all I can do math, right? But if you know the big numbers, it, statistically speaking, the people in that country will go their entire lives and never once meet a Christian, which meant that when I met people, I was maybe the only Christian they would meet their entire life. Talk about pressure. I'll never forget the first month or two we were there. We, it was like 9 o'clock at night one night. We're like, hey, we want to go to the park. And we just did because we didn't have kids. And you can do free stuff like that when you, you know, you just, oh, the baby's not, there's no baby. You just go to the park at 9 o'clock at night. It was so great. We were at the park. We're walking. We met a young man in his uh, early 20s, university student, spoke a little bit of English. And uh, we had only been there a couple months, hadn't learned the language yet. And he's like, why are you in our country? Well, you know, we can't be like, oh, we're a missionary here. You know, that's illegal. We didn't want to go to jail in the first month or two. That'd be pretty bad. But we were talking. We're like, well, we love God. And he's like, well, I love God because, you know, he's a good Muslim. And, and at one point I said, well, we follow the Bible. And he stopped and he looked at me and said, what's the Bible? And I just blown away. Because remember, I didn't get saved until I was 19, but I knew what a Bible was. I knew what who Jesus was. I'd heard the name. I've seen church. I've seen the billboards. I've seen the signs. I've seen all the things. We live in a world where the opportunity is around us. We can see it. Not everyone is Christian, and we need to do all we can to share their love with them, but there is access here. And this young man lived in a country where there was no access, no opportunity to hear. And in today's world, there are 3.43 billion people that live in that kind of an environment. 8 billion in the world, 40% live in a country or a place or a region where they have no churches, they have no Bibles, there are no Christians, 
There are no billboards talking about Jesus. None of that. I'll never forget when, when December rolled around, there was no Christmas. They didn't celebrate Christmas. I don't even think about it anymore. It's such a part of our culture and who we are. Even, not even followers of Jesus, you know, celebrate Christmas. Everyone, because it's just our culture, our, 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 our context. Here was a place there was no Christmas. And in today's world of 2024, when literally we have access to more information in our pocket than history has had combined, the fact that there are still places that have no access, it just, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart to think that someone could go through this whole life and never be told God loves you and never know that Jesus died for them. It breaks my heart to think that they have to live through life and, and, and all the struggles on their own with no one to be there to walk with them, with no one to help them in the, in the tough times. But we're the answer, right? We're the answer. These places are unreached because they're hard. It's difficult. I can't tell you the number of missionaries that we have uh, appointed to go, who've, who've raised their support and get churches to support them and pray for them, they get to the country and then they're kicked out in less than six months or a year. Just last summer we had someone kicked out again. Governments don't want it. You've seen the news, you know about the wars and the fighting and, the, and all the situations where it's tough. And then you go to these kind of countries where if someone does accept Jesus, they face persecution from family or friends. We had a family that we worked with that had the mother, the father, and four children and um, we, we worked, I spent most of my time with the father, there was um, a wife and three daughters and then a son who was you know, five or six when we knew him back then. Spent most of my time with the father, unfortunately he was very abusive, physically, emotionally, just wasn't there. The mom and the oldest two daughters eventually accepted Christ. Um, we spent so much time with them, they, they were homeless for about a month, they lived with us at the time and, and um, at one point he, the, the husband was beating the wife and he split her forehead open and you know, she still has a scar today and just bleeding and stuff. And normally in that culture, you know, they don't call the police or things, but his family, her family would come over and have a little chat with him, like, what's going on here? In this case, he called her brothers first and he said, I, I want you to know what happened and what I did to your sister. And I did that because she was talking to me in the name of Jesus and the family was like, oh, well then you did the right thing. And another young man in a neighboring country, a friend of ours and one of, you know, our missionaries who was there and he, young college student, accepted Christ and he was a follower of Jesus and my friend and I happened to be in the US at the time at a, at a conference and it was during a, a, um, a holiday season for Islam and his family said, if you don't turn away from Jesus before this two weeks is up, we're gonna kill you. That's what they told him. And he was sending us pictures and he was being beaten daily and the bruises and all this stuff because his family was like, you can't live that way. When we hear those stories, you know, we think, is it, is it really worth it? Is it really worth it for us to go and take the gospel to places like this where it's so hard and it's so difficult and you know, we got people supporting us back here and they're like, hey, send us that newsletter. How many people got saved this week? And we're like, well, I got, people got beat up. I, I, I mean, it's, it's hard. We gotta ask ourselves, is it worth it? But then I'm reminded of, of the churches that we have in Latin America and the churches we have in Africa where 100 years ago we sent missionaries and, and they went and they suffered and they endured hardships and Early on in Peru, one of our first missionaries went, they couldn't uh, evangelize, they had to teach English for 25 years because it was illegal. And one of the very first pastors, his daughter, was six years old at the time. She told this story a couple years ago when she was 96 years old. And so this was 90 years ago. She went to the store and bought bread and brought it back to the house and the whole family ate it and then they all passed out, they got sick or something. Someone came to, ran to get help, only to discover that the entire village had come to watch them die because they had got together to poison them to get rid of the Christian influence. 90 years ago, well probably 100 now because I heard it years ago. Today, the church in Peru is on fire. They're exploding, we have churches everywhere, they're church planning, they're, on, they're evangelizing, they're sending out their own missionaries. It's amazing to see what God's done. The same is true in Africa. We planted five different countries, or churches in five different countries in Africa. Today, there, we have churches in 17 countries in Africa, most of them planted by other African missionaries, other African churches. The Wesleyan church that we are part of is a global Wesleyan church. It's actually larger outside of North America. You have brothers and sisters in Christ around the world, and it's because faithful people went and said, yes, I'm gonna go. We didn't stop sending when they faced those hardships. We didn't stop sending when there were no results. We didn't stop sending when people were dying on the field. 
And for 60, 70 years, we, we, we plowed the fields and we removed the stones and we, and we planted seeds and then the, the gospel day just exploded and churches went on fire. And we celebrate that today. And so as I look at the places that are difficult today, it's like, is it worth it all? Absolutely. Absolutely, it's worth the sacrifice to go. That young man I told you about two weeks past, his family didn't kill him. They, he lost his job and had to, you know, a lot of different things happened. But several months after that, his family came to him and said, you know, we don't agree with what you've done, but we see the difference in your life and we respect how you are living. And he went on to start two Bible study groups with Muslim young people in a Muslim country. That family I told you about, the, the mother and the two oldest daughters were believers and they went on to get married and to believing men and just two summers ago, someone was there in a the country and, and was at a wedding and sent us a picture of the wedding family and it was the young boy of that family who had gotten married and in the background was all the family, his two older sisters with their husbands and their children. We're now being raised in a Christian home in a Muslim country. So maybe it wasn't for that generation but maybe it was for the next generation the one after that. But when we step out in faith and we trust God, we do the miraculous, amen? amen. As disciples of Jesus, when we say, I, can, I, I wanna live for you, Lord, I wanna do the crazy, the miraculous, I wanna do, be a part of your mission, your great commission, the Lord who has all authority in heaven will be with us and empower us to do that, right? I love Peter, I don't know how many of you know the disciple Peter, I love Peter, he's my favorite disciple because that dude did dumb stuff. He said dumb things, he put his foot in his mouth so many times, and I, I just can relate to him so well. Sometimes I'll be reading and Peter will do something dumb. I'm like, no, no, no. I'll read it again just hoping he doesn't do the same thing. He always does the same thing. He's just, he's just Peter, I'm like, no, stop. Peter, don't you ever learn? But guess what? Other than Jesus Christ, Peter's the only person I know who ever walked on water. Any of you ever walked on water? If you had the opportunity to walk on water today, would you? Let me see your hands up. If your hand's not up, put it up, because you know you would. That's right. You'd have your phone out. You'd be doing the latest TikTok dance on top of the water. You'd be live streaming it, showing everybody, because that's the miraculous. And you can't do the miraculous in your own strength. You can only do it through the power of God. That's what we need to do. We need to make up the new TikTok on the water dance. That's, that's, I'm, youth group, that's on you. You guys come up with the new on the water dance TikTok. Let's make this happen. And let's like living for Jesus on mission, TikTok on the water dance. When we step out in Jesus' name, we can accomplish the miraculous through his strength, and he wants us to do that. So many people often, you know, like, you know that's all wonderful, that's good, that's, your, that, that's a great thing, you know, you're a missionary or a pastor, but that's not me. I'm not a pastor, I'm not a missionary. I, I, I can't do that stuff. I'm an elementary education teacher. I didn't get saved until I was 19. I love Star Wars, I play video games, I got ADHD, ADHD, HD. one of them, something. 2015, I was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, that's one of the blood cancers. No cure for it, I live with it today. At the time, they were like, yeah, you maybe got 10, 15 years, I'm over 10 years now, kicking this butt, can we get an amen? What? That's right. Did all the, the chemo stuff, was on you know, pills and stuff for five years, did a stem cell transplant. That's crazy. I don't know what all that is. You have to ask my wife because I'm just like, hurry up and get it done. I got people to go talk about Jesus with. I still have to go. I have an appointment next Tuesday, actually. I still go regularly to keep monitoring and check things because there's no cure or whatever. And unless the Lord decides to do a miracle, which I'm always open for, just letting him know, you know. Unless he tries to do that, I probably will go home earlier than I imagined that I might, you know. And I have longings. I want to see my kids, as you know, move out the house. I want to see them grandbabies coming over so I can give them sugar and send them home. I want to do all that stuff. I have those longings. And maybe I'll see it, maybe I won't. But I want you to hear one thing from me today. I'm not defined by my education. I'm not defined by my past. I'm not defined by any disease or health issues I'm facing. I am a child of God. I belong to Jesus. I am his son. And if I've got five years or 50 years, I'm going to be walking on water for him. And that's you. 
Every one of you have your own story. Every one of you have the difficulties and things you're facing, whether it's physical health issues, whether it's financial issues, whether it's skills or self esteem whatever's going on, you've got those things. But that's part of your story. But the reality is that you are a child of God. That's what defines you. And you have been commissioned by the King of kings, the Lord of lords, creator of all things, to take this message to the world. Amen? And so I want to challenge us today. Will you step out and say, Lord, in what ways can I be on mission for you right here in my community? And so the four and ten who have no access can ever hear that. That's the challenge. And there are ways you can get involved. You can be praying right now. You can start praying for the world. You can be like, how can we, you know, all the things I see in the news, the words, Lord, I want to pray that Jesus will come and know those, and, and people will know the gospel. They will hear the name. I want to pray. You can pray for missionaries, people that go. You can say, I want to, Lord, bless them and help them to do the things that you've called them to do. You can be in prayer. Pray for new Bible translations to be done. Pray for new technology and ways to get the gospel into these places. You can be a prayer warrior right now, right here today, every one of you. You can send people. There are people who are wanting to go, They're wanting to, and, and they need to get there, and we as a church need to send them. If people are willing to move halfway around the world in the Muslim context, we need to send them. And that might mean living sacrificially here so that we can give more, that we can send them. We need to send them, amen? And we need to go. Some of you in this room, I think God's calling, saying, I want you to be some of those weird ones that move halfway around the world to the Muslim world to take the gospel. We need to go. If you've never done that, Take a short-term trip. I know your church does them. Go on a short-term trip. Look into ways you can, you can step out in faith and say, I want to be willing to go, to move to another country, another place. You can do those. Because why? We serve the King of Kings. He who has all authority, and he is with us, and he's empowered us. Would you stand with me today as we pray? Father God, we love you so much. We're so thankful, Jesus, for the sacrifice that you made on the cross. So thankful for the, 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 the pain that you endured, for the way that you came down to give everything up for us. Oh God, we give you praise. We can never thank you enough for that, but we just give you praise and say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We are so blessed to be adapt, adopted into the family of God, to be considered your children, to be considered your sons and daughters, and to be so much loved by you that you have blessed us and empowered us to say yes, to be on mission for you. Whoa to think that we can work for you. You created this entire world and you want us to be on your mission with you. What a joy, what an honor, what a privilege. Jesus, I ask today that you would speak to each and every one of our hearts, that you would help us to pause before you and say, Lord, how would you have me serve you? How can I be living out the Great Commission right here in my community? And how can I be living out the Great Commission for those who've never had a chance to hear, no matter how difficult it is? God, I want to walk on water for you. I want to live commissionally for you, Jesus. I pray you would give us the courage to ask that question and then the courage to say yes to whatever you're asking of us, God. We do this for your glory and your praise. And we give all glory to you in Jesus' name. Amen.